fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. So joining us, we have a person that's written a great book. And I, I've, I've really enjoyed it. And, and Mike, you've been listening to it as well, haven't you? Yes, yep. And um, I think I think we both have said that, that you know we've uh, learned uh, so much uh, that we didn't know um, at the time. And the level of, the level of detail in the book is uh, has really stricken me, and it's presented in a way that uh, a lay person like myself can really understand a little bit about uh, the nuclear power industry and especially the soviet nu- nuclear power industry yeah no it's pretty amazing um yeah and i mean god i mean if you can understand it then wow exactly i am canadian <laughs> <laughs> i'm so nice uh so the book is midnight in chernobyl and it's the untold story of the world's greatest nuclear disaster and adam higginbotham is with us how are you doing today adam Great, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, so, so, you know, Adam, what got you into this writing about this story, and what got you into doing the book? Uh, well, I think originally, I mean, because I began researching the subject quite a long time ago, back in 2005, um, in the lead up to the 20th anniversary of the, the disaster, and at that point, I was, I was, I was interested in in writing about it largely because it was just this sort of this epic story of, of kind of, of um, human frailty and of a you know of one of the greatest uh, events of the second half of the 20th century that, that at that point had never really been given um, a detailed narrative treatment uh, in the way that I was interested in writing about it. and I and what happened is I initially approached it as a, as a magazine story where I just wanted to reconstruct the events of the night of April the 26th, 1986, the, the, the early morning, the night of the 25th of April, the early morning of the 26th, which is when the accident happened. So I, I set out to, to interview eyewitnesses to the disaster, surviving eyewitnesses, um, just to do that, to, to reconstruct that short period of time, um, inspired really by having recently read Walter Lord's book about the sinking of the Titanic, A Night to Remember. Um, it, which is exactly the same thing. Uh, you know, he just reconstructs the night of the sinking of the Titanic through interviewing eyewitnesses and, and reading congressional testimony. Um, but when I actually got to Moscow in, in, um, in February 2006 and I started meeting people who'd been there at the moment of the explosion, um, you know, I realized that there was a, a kind of much wider story to be told. And I realized right at the beginning that, that my conception of of what these people and what their experience had been like had been colored by you know cold war propaganda because i was 17 at the time of the accident and so my expectations of what they would be like was just kind of way off and i didn't really i hadn't really given much thought to what their lives were like before the accident and what their lives were like you know in the years long after the accident had taken place until i started talking to them and i realized that the story kind of stretched back into the past and reached right up into the present day um, and it was then that I realized that there was a, there was a, you know, there was a potentially great book to be written about it. Now, when you were meeting people like witnesses and, uh, and talking to people that were around at the time and involved and even trying to get documents or um, did, was it difficult to get people to talk or, or you know, because being in, in the Soviet Union or uh, Russia now, is it, it, was it very tight? Were people scared to talk to you? I mean, no, but I don't think anybody was really frightened to talk to me. It was just that, it, you know, it depended on who you were talking to, on, on how open they would be. 
Um, you know, there were some people I spoke to who had never spoken to a journalist before, who, who really wanted to talk about their stories and, and share their experiences with a, with a wider public and, and were, um, you know, extremely engaged with the idea of being given the opportunity to talk about what had happened to them. Um, and there are other people, you know, who, who, who had worked inside the Soviet nuclear industry and, and worked inside the, you know, the most secret aspects of it, who, you know, even all that time afterwards, 30 years after um, the accident and a long time after the collapse of the Soviet Union, you know, they still felt bound by these oaths of secrecy they'd taken to, to the USSR. Um, so I would say things like, well, can, can you tell me about, um, you know, what it was like to work at Laboratory 23 in um, Komsomorsk on Amur? And they would say, well, I mean, <clears throat> you, you, you seem to know an awful lot about that. Um, how, how did you know about that? I, I, I can't possibly talk about that because, you know, that's, that would be secret. And, you know, they're talking, about, they're talking about work that they did in, like, 1971. Um, so there were those people. And then there were people who you'd expect to be uh, reluctant to talk about anything who were only too happy to sit down with me and, and have a cup of tea and talk for several hours, like uh, former members of the Ukrainian KGB. Um, it turned out that the, the Ukrainian K, former members of the Ukrainian KGB have a, um, have a sort of association of, of, of ex-KGB officers. And so I got in touch with, you know, the, the gen, former general who heads that organization, and, and he set me up with, you know, interviews with two or three of his former colleagues, a couple of whom were only too happy to talk about their, their experiences. So now, with the, with the disaster itself, what do, you, what do you think the biggest lesson can be learned from that? Like, what, looking back at it now, what do you think that... Um, is the most important thing we get from it. I think that, that um, you know, the most, the most obvious part of it to me um, that we can learn from is, is, you know, a lesson of technological hubris and complacency and, and trust in technology. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because, because part of the reason that the accident happened in the first place was, was similar to the sinking of the Titanic. You know, the, the White Star Line managed to convince everybody that the Titanic was an unsinkable ship. And the leaders of the Soviet nuclear industry, similarly, in the, in the years before the accident, managed to convince people that the model of reactor that was in use at Chernobyl was one of the safest in the world. Um, and they themselves had this remarkably reckless and complacent attitude towards the dangers of radiation. Um, and, it, it, you know, those were the things that really laid the path to the accident. And I think that that complacency about technology is something that we still suffer from today. You know, although it's, it's moved on from mechanical and nuclear engineering into, you know, artificial intelligence and, and, and platforms like Facebook. So those are the, I think that's the most important lesson that I would take away from it. Yeah, because I almost get the feeling that uh, um, throughout the whole um, time, uh, we, see, um, we see people almost in denial like, uh, uh, especially, you know, about the core, no, it, it couldn't have exploded. It doesn't happen. And uh, and even about just cutting off the city and shutting the phones down and not letting people out of the city, it was almost like uh, it couldn't be a disaster. It doesn't happen here in Russia. Absolutely. But I, I think that, that in addition to the sort of the institutional denial um, that was kind of baked into the, the organs of the Soviet Union by that point in time. Um, you know, there was something much more human at work in the initial hours after the explosion, which was that, you know, even the, the, the senior technicians who really knew what they were talking about in terms of nuclear technology, you know, they simply couldn't comprehend that an accident like this had happened in front of them, even when they could see the evidence with their own eyes. And I think that's a, you know, that it, it, it was a sort of psychological syndrome that these people were experiencing where, you know, one nuclear expert who was, who was the leader of the, the emergency response team uh, for nuclear plants who flew in from Moscow very soon after the explosion happened um, and was one of the first men to look at the reactor from the air passing over in a heli helicopter. You know, he wrote in his memoirs afterwards that, that looking, even looking down on the blazing core of this nuclear reactor that was open to the air um, from just a few hundred meters away, he had to struggle to make his brain comprehend what his eyes were seeing. 
because even he, a nuclear expert, could not believe that this nuclear reactor had exploded. Adam, you've talked about um, this you know, extensive research, and as you're talking now about how people were just in shock and disbelief and complete denial, you know, you can, I can really hear the emotion in, in your voice as, as you're kind of almost reliving that with them. How did you manage through your research? How did it affect you emotionally? Um, I think that I, um, I mean, I think the most profound way in which it affected me was when, I, you know, when I first, in the years after I first met the first eyewitnesses I spoke to, um, because I think the first two people I, I actually sat down in a room with to talk to were Alexander and Natalia Yevchenko, who, who became, you know, principal protagonists in the story of the book. Um, you know, I, I was so uh, affected by their stories and the things they told me about their lives, particularly their lives before the accident, and which which made me realise, you know, how much they'd lost. Because, um, as I said, I didn't, you know, I had this very stereotypical conception of what life in the Soviet Union was like, and it was only when I began talking to people like to Sasha and Natasha that, 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 that I realised that, you know, I was 17 when the accident happened. They were in their mid 20s. They, you know, they'd got a two-year-old son, and you know, far from being these sort of grey automatons who who were, you know, walking in lockstep towards a grim socialist future, you know, they were young people who had hopes and, and ambitions and expectations of the future exactly like mine, really. Mm -hmm. um, and so, after I talked to them, you know, their stories really stayed with me. So, after I'd done that first magazine story in 2006, I then I then went back and did another magazine story in 2011. Um, and after that, you know, I remained kind of quite hung up on the story, so I kept coming back to it. And it was only on the, the third go-round when I found myself thinking of, a, of another magazine story that I wanted to write a few years later that, that I finally realized that, you know, there was a, a much bigger, more in-depth project to be, to be written about this because it was, the subject and the people wouldn't really let go of me. And did it have a, an influence on the way you lived your life, meeting that those individuals and such, such powerful stories and very humbling? Did it have an influence on, on your life and how you then lived it? I don't think so. I think the most profound effect it had on me is that the book completely took over my life for about five <laughs> years. <laughs> I think sometimes when we when we um, we we learn about others' experiences that that do humble us, and we we try and understand, well, especially when writing a book, and um, sometimes we can, I, I don't know, sometimes I think it, it does influence us in a way. It makes us grateful, or um, and and maybe you know, I don't know, a set of values in terms of how we live our life can change. Yeah, I mean, I think that. Um that certainly the Yevchenko's story kind of affected me in that way because because um, you know there are a lot of there are a lot of convict, conflicting versions of of what happened and there are a lot of conflicting views of the individuals involved in the story. Um, so you, a lot of people I talked to would single out you know specific individuals who they'd either encountered or they'd read about or they held responsible for what had happened. Um, but Sasha Yevchenko was someone about whom nobody ever had a bad word to say um, and I, would, I came across cr quite a few people who would say please write more about him because, uh, because you know, he was a wonderful person and, and a, a true hero and everybody loved him um, and that, was, that, that really did strike me and that did stay with me I was going to say now, now what, what really um let the world know what happened was the uh, alarm, radiation alarm that went off in a plant in Sweden, I believe. Is that is that right? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More than a thousand miles away from the Chernobyl plant. So, so you think that they they were just going to keep that secret? They weren't going to let people onto this at all, even though it was going to affect other countries around them. Well, I think that the thing is that their previous experience with radiation accidents had taught them that it was possible to cover them up um, because the, before April 1986, the worst radiation accident 
in human history had taken place in a closed city outside Chelyabinsk in the Urals in September 1957. Um, and that had remained completely secret. In fact, that remained completely secret until after the fall of the Soviet Union. They never admitted it took place. They covered it all up. Um, but in that case, you know, that they were aided by geography and meteorology because what happened is the explosion took place, you know, deep inside the, the, um, the borders of the Soviet Union, a long way from, from Europe. At the point when the explosion that, that caused the accident took place, the wind carried it eastwards, further into the interior of the USSR and not westward towards Europe. Um, and so, so they'd managed to successfully cover that up, um, as they had done, you know, many other radiation accidents. And, and if you look at the way that they treated any kind of industrial accident or, you know, major international incident, only, only a few years before the Chernobyl accident, you know, Soviet fighter pilots had inadvertently shot down the Korean airliner, KL-007, killing everybody on board. And for days afterwards, you know, they continued to deny that they'd had anything to do with it. So, you know, this level of, of, of um, denial and obfuscation and lying was, you know, was ingrained at the very highest levels of the Soviet political system. So certainly when the Chernobyl accident happened, their initial reaction was, was simply to, to pretend that it hadn't happened at all. You know, of course, you know, the, the radiation released was, was released on such a scale and so close to the western borders of the USSR that ultimately there was no covering it up. But even after these radiation alarms went off in Sweden, the Soviet government continued to pretend that nothing had happened. <laughs> yeah, never mind, it wasn't me. The, um, yes, exactly. <laughs> now, now, I've heard now, I don't know if this is true, now this is um, the milk and the dairy and all sorts of products throughout Europe um, were really kind of um, banned because of this. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, the Italian government banned the sale of, of, um, of green vegetables for a while after the accident, and, it, and children in Poland were forbidden from drinking fresh milk, um, you know, because these, these things were tested and found to be uh, contaminated with radiation, that it, that it, um, the radio nuclides that had escaped from the reactor in Chernobyl. And that continues to be the case in, in, in some agricultural products for, for decades afterwards. It's only very recently that um, lamb from sheep um, graze in the mountains in Scotland and, and Wales in Great Britain have been deemed safe for human consumption again because they were, they were grazing on grassland that had been contaminated with fallout from Chernobyl in 1986. So do we know the long-term effects and the cause, and, you know, how many people that um, have, have got sick from this or cancer or died, do, do we know how, that, how that's affected the world? It's an extremely controversial subject. Um, the, the one thing that we can say without any doubt is that the release of iodine-131 from the explosion and the fire that followed caused at least 5,000 cases of thyroid cancer in the worst affected areas, um, particularly in children. The number of deaths um, can only ever really be an estimate, partly because of the way in which the Soviet government covered up health uh, information about those affected by the accident immediately afterwards, partly because of the confusion and the sort of diaspora of people from around the, the, con the contaminated areas um, that was caused by the breakup of the Soviet Union. Um, and partly because the, the complexities of epidemiology make it almost impossible to directly link any given cancer to radiation released from an accident like this. So the parameters of people's estimates are pretty broad. Uh, the French epidemiologist Elizabeth Cardis estimated that there would be 9,000 cases of fatal cancers connected to the accident. Um, but then, on the other hand, Greenpeace at one point released a figure of 200,000 deaths that mm -hmm. could be linked to the accident. Um, and although you know, most of the, the scientists and, and radiation specialists I spoke to suggested to me that there was no scientific basis for such an enormous figure, 
Um, and it was much, clo- much more likely to be closer to the 9,000 figure. The truth is that nobody really knows. Hmm. So now you call this worse than uh, even the Japanese. Um, uh, do you think this is the worst nuclear disaster ever? Oh, I think unquestionably. I think the, the, in terms of the level of radiation released and in terms of the number of people who were affected, um, there's, there's no question that it's the, the largest in history, although obviously it's not really a competition. Um, you know, the, the, there were 116,000 people evacuated from the area around the plant uh, in, the first, in the first month after it happened, and, and hundreds of thousands of people more were evacuated from areas of Belarus and Ukraine after that. Um, and you've got 600,000 people were brought into the area in order to, to help deal with the cleanup. Mm. Um, so all of those people were affected by the accident. So this is just, a, you know, the, the impact it had on people's lives is absolutely enormous. So now you, you, you also suggested that the uh, costs and the, and the cleanup and, and the whole Chernobyl, um, you know, uh, incident was really kind of the beginning of the downfall for USSR and Gorbachev. I think that the, the financial cost of it had, had some impact on what was already a, a sort of teetering economy. But I think what was, what's much more important is the, the social and political consequences that it had, mm-hmm. because the accident really opened up fissures that had previously only been latent in Soviet society, principally because Gorbachev's increasing openness and preparedness to allow reporting of what had really happened um, in the months after the accident happened, and after their initial cover-up, began to make it clear to the, even the most die-hard communists that their government had been misleading them and their government had been lying to them, it, initially merely about you know, the problems within the Soviet nuclear industry. But gradually, this, you know, Chernobyl itself proved to be a sort of bellwether for, for more open reporting about other m- problems more broadly in Soviet society. But I think that most importantly... <coughs> The, the biggest contribution that it made towards the collapse of the Soviet Union was, was what it did to Mikhail Gorbachev's own mindset. Because in the lead-up to the accident, he had been talking about glasnost and perestroika, so about more open government and about economic reform. But he'd, he'd, these things had really only been slogans before April 1986, and he'd been moving very gingerly and very carefully. But when he began to realize exactly how misled he had been about the state of the nuclear industry and and that even something as ostensibly um, high-tech and sophisticated as the nuclear industry had been just, you know, riven with lying and deception and cover-up. And he, and he began to realize how much had been kept from him, the leader of the entire Soviet Union. He realized how rotten the entire system that he'd inherited had become. And it, it convinced him that if he was going to save the Soviet Union from collapse, he had to plunge into these reforms really deeply and really quickly. And the problem was that the, the result of that was he engaged in these economic reforms that would carry out so quickly, so speedily and so drastically, that they were just this complete mess. And the whole thing was botched. And it was those economic reforms that really destroyed the Soviet Union, not, you know, the individual cost of the Chernobyl accident or the lies that emerged from the accident itself. It was the way in which Gorbachev reacted to it in the long term that destroyed the USSR. And the fact that so many uh, people were affected uh, shook everyone else's uh, pride in the the Soviet idea, that idea of uh, that the Soviet technology is perfect, the way of Soviet life is perfect. There were a few instances of that uh, happening at that exact time. For example, uh, Andrei Chikatilo, uh, one of the most prolific serial killers, was also active at that time uh, and at his height at that exact moment. So there was a, a whole bunch of things that went into that, as you say, that downfall of the, the right. Soviets. Right, absolutely. I mean, the, you know, the system was already crumbling, and this and Chernobyl certainly did not help. So I, I'm wondering now. So the the nuclear power and um, Russia that was really kind of like the uh, the 
I would say, like the space race for them, wasn't it? It wasn't it kind of a propaganda, prestige, something very important for them to. They had the first uh, commercial reactor, wasn't that this one? It was. It was. I mean, the the the, the value of nuclear power to the to the Soviet government was was held to be similar to that of of superiority in the space race. You know, they, they, these were two cutting edge technologies that the Soviet Union at one point led the world in. And they did, they, they, they brought online the first nuclear power plant that was connected to an electrical grid. So there's this kind of, there's, there's, it's one of these things where it's all a bit, um, it's, it's, it's fine gradations of qualification for being the first in the world. So the Odenings plant was the first one that actually fed commercial electricity to an electrical grid. Even though it wasn't a lot of electricity, it was nonetheless the first in the world to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and that was in 1954. And, you know, right at the beginning, they seemed to be, you know, leagues ahead of, of the nuclear industry in the West and in the United States. But then gradually, because of internal political machinations, they slowly fell behind. And at the same time, they began falling behind in the space race. You know, so they went from having the first satellite in space and having the first man in space to ultimately effectively losing when the United States landed on the moon. Um, and, and at the same time, the same thing was happening to the nuclear industry. And, and part of the reason that the Chernobyl plant um, was built in the way it was was because they just went into, at the end of the 1960s, they went into, into a crash program of nuclear construction in this desperate bid to build as many reactors as possible and catch up with the West. And it was that need for, for haste that, that laid some of the path towards Chernobyl. What do you think the problem was with this? Was it a design problem? Is that kind of the bottom line? It was initially, it, there was a design problem that um, that was gradually revealed pretty quickly after they built the first of these reactors and, and brought it online at the beginning of the 70s. So by the time of the accident in, in 86, the leaders of the Soviet nuclear industry um, were well aware of the fact that this design of reactor, the RBMK it was known as, um, had numerous technical faults. But they, they did their best to cover them up and they, they did very little to rectify these faults. And what they did instead was to rewrite the instruction manuals that the operators used to try and ensure that as long as they followed the instructions to the letter, then nothing bad would happen. There wouldn't be any accidents so long as the operators followed to the absolute letter every one of these instructions in these giant instruction manuals. The problem was that this insistence on following rules to the letter came up against another Soviet uh, another epidemic Soviet problem, which was that the entire economy, the centralized economy, was, was run um, on these, again, like the nuclear industry itself, was run on principles of falsification and of overambitious goals and um, absurd expectations of everybody from those working in a tractor factory to those producing electricity at a nuclear plant. Everybody had ridiculous targets that they were supposed to meet and quotas to fill. And in order to meet these targets, everybody had to cut corners and bend the rules. Uh, so by the time of the accident, you know, the plant, the plant staff had become accustomed to just ignoring rules that would kind of get in the way and, get, and, and disregarding bits of red tape. And so although they got these manuals that would give them all of these rules and regulations and updated procedures for how to, to use an RBMK reactor in the safest possible way, they were all equally long-versed in ignoring rules that were inconvenient. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the confluence of these two forces ultimately led towards the behavior that resulted in the accident. So, now, and this wasn't the first time they've had a, a problem with uh, a nuclear um, plant, reactor, or anything like that. They've, they kept other ones secret. Oh, there's a whole history of, of um, accidents at nuclear plants. But because it was run, the nuclear industry was, was run by what was known as the Ministry of Media and Machine Building, uh, which was the agency that was responsible for the atom weapons program, but also 
the whole of the civilian nuclear fuel cycles, the most important part of the of the civilian nuclear industry. Everything was 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 deeply secret. Everything was regarded as a state secret. And it meant that every time there was an accident, frequently even the people working at the plant where the accident had taken place wouldn't be told about what had happened and wouldn't be told why it had happened. So there was this kind of vast body of knowledge from which everybody could have learned and, and learned from their mistakes in the past to avoid future accidents that nobody was able to draw on. They only ever heard about these things you know, via, the, via this kind of internal rumor mill. Um, and, and everything was regarded as secret. So it just it created this extremely dangerous environment. It's really, really a, a crazy situation. Uh, so what exactly do you think was the problem with what they did? Like, um, it's just that the people weren't trained well enough or... Um, you know, because it was it was basically um, some sort of safety test that they were running, and um, that's where it all sort of happened, right? It was. It was a, a safety test that that should have been conducted on the reactor when it first came online, before it first came online at the end of 1983, so more than three years earlier. Um, but it's not really it's not really true to say that the the operators weren't well trained. They were, you know, they were all extremely well educate, educated and well-versed in the details of nuclear physics and reactor physics. But what they didn't know was the, the limitations of the reactor that they were using. And they didn't know the extent of these design faults or how they could be combined to create a catastrophe. So they brought the reactor inadvertently in, prepar in preparing for the test they brought the reactor into a state of extreme instability because they didn't know uh, some of these they, they hadn't paid close enough attention to some of these rules that had been written into the, the guidelines to prevent accidents taking place but most importantly the one thing that they, they were ignorant of and certainly ignorant of the significance of was the worst design fault of all, which was that the control rods with which they managed the power of the reactor, um, which would all be inserted in the, in the, the case of a shutdown into the reactor at once. Um, for a brief second after they'd been inserted under some circumstances, these control rods, instead of reducing reactor power, could briefly increase reactor power. So this is an emergency system where it, it worked almost in reverse. So it was as if you, the, the accelerator and brake pedals in a car um, were wired together so that they did the opposite of what they were supposed to. So you'd be driving the car along, you'd want to stop it, suddenly you'd stamp on the brake, and instead of slowing down, the car would suddenly speed up. And that's what happened with these control rods, is that, is that when they first inserted them at the end of the test, Having brought the reactor into this state of extreme instability, they inserted the control rods to shut the reactor down. And at precisely the point when they thought it was all over and they were going to just be able to relax for the night, suddenly the instrumentation reported a sudden power surge. And by that time, it was too late. It was all over. There was nothing they could do. So all they could do was watch their instrumentation reveal that something terrible was happening deep inside the reactor. And the next thing they knew, there was a shuddering and a huge bang and they saw dust coming down from the ceiling. And then what happened next is the reactor exploded. I was really taken by uh, Dyatlov's uh, reaction. Would you like to talk about that a little more? Well, Dyatlov was one of the people who, who you know, initially refused to believe um, that the reactor could have exploded because he, um, you know, like other senior members of staff, had just... Had just never, never been able to... Had, had always had always been told that that was simply impossible. Um, so I think that's what, what governed his reaction. You know, he was extremely experienced. He'd worked with dozens of nuclear reactors in various different facilities previously and had also been involved in a previous nuclear accident in which he had been exposed to a great deal of radiation. So he had, you know, adopted this complacent and rather reckless attitude not only to reactor technology but also to the dangers of radiation. Uh, and I think that's that's one of the things that governed his reaction after the explosion took place. 
So uh, what's Chernobyl like now? Like where, what's it, what did they do with it and, and what's going on there now? Well, the exclusion zone that they established in uh, May of 1986, soon after the accident took place, where they evacuated all these thousands of people from an area of around 1,500 square miles around the reactor, remains uh, a, a radioactive wasteland, effectively. It it's, remains empty, largely empty of people, surrounded by a perimeter fence patrolled by um, guards from the Interior Ministry. But, um, you know, tourism is now a, 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 um, a principal draw is, uh, in, in the exclusion zone. So there are now regular bus trips from Kiev bringing hundreds of people in every week. I think 70,000 people visited the Chernobyl exclusion zone <laughs> last year to visit the town of Pripyat, which is this you know, the company town, which was built to accommodate the workers from the plant and their families, which was only three kilometers away from the reactor itself. Um, you know, the, the people are decanted from these buses every day and take Chernobyl selfies of, of themselves standing in front of the, of the reactor building with, a, with a, a radiation dosimeter in front of their faces so that their friends can see how much radiation there is. Um, you know, and I, I did, I, when I began work on the book, I sardonically said to my agent that, you know, if the book was successful and, and I succeeded in what I was trying to do in, in writing a definitive, objective account of the accident, you know, it would become the book that was sold in the Chernobyl souvenir shop, in yeah. little <laughs> suspecting that one day there really would be a Chernobyl souvenir shop. And apparently now there's more than one. I mean, this has happened since I was last there, because I haven't visited, I think, since 2016. But um, I saw a report recently where they were, they were mentioning that there's, there's at least two uh, souvenir shops on the perimeter of the exclusion zone where people <laughs> on their way home can stop off and, and buy a mug with a, a radiation symbol on it and, uh, you know, like a kind of yellow T-shirt commemorating their trip to Pripyat. And there's even a cafe there now, apparently. <laughs> I was there was a, I saw reports of a um, of a rave that took place in in Pripyat last year actually where everybody had to wear a sort of hazmat suit <laughs> and they weren't allowed to wander off but they you know they had you know there were several hours of live of uh, of dance music being played in the center of Pripyat and people dancing. Well, of course, listen <laughs> to some dance music and get your Starbucks coffee. Hey, I guess you don't need a glow stick if you're going to the rave at. <laughs> 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 Sorry. That's bad. That's bad. We're not touching that one. <laughs> wow. So now, now they built something over the um, like the, the actual um, core or building for that that went down, didn't they, to protect people or protect the world? Well, they did. They, I mean, immediately after the accident, uh, they needed to cover cover up the reactor because it was still open to the air. So even after the initial fire went out, which burned for around 10 days after the explosion, they, they then needed to stop radiation leaking out into the, the atmosphere, into the environment. So they engaged in this program to build this thing called the sarcophagus, or they, which they eventually called the sarcophagus, which was this giant concrete and steel tent, really, that was constructed over the top of the ruins of the reactor, which remained so radioactive they had to build, build by remote, remote control using uh, large cranes and, and closed-circuit television cameras. But although at the time the Soviet government reported that this you know, was intended to last for decades, mm -hmm. 100 years, I think. It looks like um, it's only uh, going to last for 30 years before they have to replace it, though. Well, this, this, was the, this was the original one that they built in 86, but they, they quickly mm. discovered, like, immediately after the Soviet <laughs> Union collapsed, Ukrainian engineers went in and discovered that the thing had got cracks in it and holes that birds could fly through, and, and it was really <laughs> not uh, the wonder of modern engineering that, that the engineers had described it as. So at that point, they began uh, looking into a program to build uh, a sarcophagus for the sarcophagus, and that is the structure that's now known as the new safe confinement that was, has literally just been completed in the last few weeks um, at the cost of several billion dollars. 
and um, you know, 33 years after the initial explosion. So now it's, they, they, the engineers that built that are now saying that that will be good for another 100 years. Yeah, and the Titanic won't sink. <laughs> the, the, uh, so, so where, where do we stand on uh, nuclear uh, power now? Is this is this something else that we're going to have continue to have problems with, especially after Japan? Or um, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think although the Chernobyl accident is 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 often kind of held up as a sort of talisman for the anti nuclear movement. I think it's important to understand that, that it, it happened in very specific circumstances. You know, as we've discussed, it, it, it happened as a result of the, the quirks and the failings of the centrally planned economy, of the, of the kind of reactor that was built there. You know, the RBMK reactor was a model of reactor that was, was never built outside the Soviet Union and could not have been because it would have failed all sorts of international safety conventions on, on um, nuclear reactors. Um, and it was really, a, you know, a product of that place and that time. So although people are, are understandably frightened of, of an accident like this happening again, the truth is that, that it's extraordinarily unlikely, and it, it could never happen in the, the U.S. nuclear industry, for example, because, you know, one thing, one principal difference between the RBMK and other reactors is that it never had a containment building. A containment building is, is something that's built over a nuclear reactor to, to keep in any radioactive release in, a, in the case of a catastrophic accident in the reactor core. Um, and so, you know, the Three Mile Island accident was, was relatively minor because there was a containment building. So even though there was a core meltdown, the radioactive gases and material that escaped, you know, was contained by the containment building. But what was built over the, the reactor in Chernobyl was essentially just a giant tin shed. And when the explosion took place, the roof of the, the building simply disappeared in the force of the explosion. Um, and had there been a containment building, the containment building would at least have done something to have kept in all of that radiation and contained the fire. Um, so I, I think it, you know, it's important to understand that really the Chernobyl could not happen again. Wow. Pretty amazing. Now, has Russia ever um, kind of uh, admitted to the uh, to the disaster now, or did, have they ever been really open about what happened? Well, they tried to cover it up. In, I mean, they tried to cover up the fact that it had happened initially, and then the next effort they engaged in was to try and whitewash the causes of the accident. So what they were determined to do was to conceal the fact that there were all these design faults and um, that the leaders of the nuclear industry had known about the design faults before the accident took place. And in order to do that, they tried to lay the blame for what happened entirely at the feet of the people who were in the control room that night and the manager of the plant. So that was the, sort of, that was the second phase of the cover-up. And they conducted this show trial where they found these men guilty and sentenced them to long um, prison terms. But just as the, uh, as the Soviet Union was falling apart, a new report was issued, and that um, finally revealed the, the truth about what had happened and, and, and laid out the, the technological path to the explosion and made it clear that although the operators were at fault to some extent, they could not be entirely blamed for what had happened. Mm -hmm. Adam, were people compensated for the trauma and the losses that they experienced because of the um, because of Chernobyl. Well, I mean, people who lived in Pripyat who lost everything. I mean, literally, you know, they 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 were told to evacuate the city. They were given the impression they would only be gone for 72 hours, and, and told that they should only take their most important documents, their internal passports, and and their you know savings books. Um, you know, they were compensated by the state in the sense that they were. They were given money to, to buy new belongings, to buy new, you know, furniture and mm -hmm. clothes and everything they would need to effectively begin their lives again in new homes. But um, although other European states petitioned the Soviet government for reparations for, for, the, for the broader costs and, um, and damage that was caused by the accident, 
I don't think that they ever paid anyone a, a, a cent for it. But I, I'm, I'm not certain. I'm, I'm, but, I, but it seems extremely unlikely. Mm. So, Just thinking and, for the longer term, longer term illnesses and um, how debilitating that can be to, to a person and a family and then not to be compensated for it. Well, part of the problem was that, that Mikhail Gorbachev initially made a public declaration in which he promised that everyone who was affected by the accident and everyone who helped in the cleanup would be taken care of by the Soviet state in just the same way that those who fought the Second World War for the Soviet Union were looked after very well and, and given a pension um, and given places to live. But what they quickly realized is this was the, the, the need for this compensation was coinciding with a collapsing Soviet economy. So the enormous financial cost of, of, of pensioning all of these people off and, and paying widows and paying medical expenses meant that they, as quickly as they could really, they began falsifying medical diagnoses of, of people who were directly affected by the disaster. So the liquidators, the people who were sent in to the zone to help in the cleanup between 1986 and 1990, you know, those people were given diagnoses that were not related to radiation injuries, in order, specifically in order to avoid having to pay to look after them um, in later life. Hmm. Now, and, and I was going to go back to the 10 people that you said were convicted of crimes. Um, so even, even now, when we know that they're not really you know they shouldn't really be put in jail they're still in jail to this day no no they were um i think the longest sentence was given to to diatlov and bruhanov bruhanov was the the director of the power plant diatlov who you mentioned was the the deputy chief um engineer for operations who oversaw the safety test that night they were given sentences of 10 years but both were released early uh, Dyatlov was released because of reasons of ill health, and Bruhanov was released on the, the cusp of the collapse of the Soviet Union um, for good behavior. Um, so he served, I think, five years, and Dyatlov served slightly less. Uh, but no, I mean, none of them could remain in, pri be, remain in prison afterwards, simply because the, the state that had imprisoned them had ceased to exist. Oh, yeah. Wow. So, Adam, do you have a website and place for people to come and uh, look you up? Uh, I do. My, my website, which is, which is really uh, an archive of, of selected past writing, is, is my name, adamhigginbotham.com, um, and I'm on Twitter. But, uh, but that's, the, that's the limit of my, my social media profile. <laughs> stay, trying to stay out of the public, are you? Smart man. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's been a great conversation. We, we're going to have your book up on our website as well, so people that are listening can just do one click and pick up the book. Um, oh, thank you. Again, it's been great. Thank you very much for being here, Adam. Not at all. I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.